My name is Jennifer Grado. I'm here from Toronto Hydro. I am the commercial business development lead. Um, it's a role that I took over in the last year, and I've been with Toronto Hydro for about five years in business development. Before that, I was with the City of Toronto in water efficiency, and before that, in a past life, I was uh, in performance contracting with Honeywell. So I've been in conservation for about 15 years, uh, which the landscape and conservation has changed quite a bit. Um, so what I want to do is give you, since everyone's fairly familiar with the Save on Energy programs, I want to give you an update. The, everything has been changing in about the last two years, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, are well aware of, um, and there are some announcements that everyone's kind of waiting for with respect to the program. So I'm going to talk us through a bit of just the base level foundation of the programs, then what's coming, and we can talk about some timelines of when you'll see those changes rolled out to the marketplace. Please interrupt me at any time. I want this to be very interactive, very informal. Uh, a lot of you know what I'm about to present, uh, pieces of it anyway. So I'll go through those pieces quickly and get to the good stuff. All right, so conservation and demand management. I'm gonna give you a high level overview of, of our directive that we launched um, conservation first framework under on January 1st, 2015. We'll talk about that transition, although we're largely through the transition into the new framework, give you the basics and the programs, do a bit of an update, and then uh, talk about where our biggest opportunities are right now. So in March of 2014, we received uh, a directive from the ministry with regards to what the next framework would look like. It's a six-year mandate, and that's uh, kind of historic because we've never had a framework that long. It covers 2015 to 2020. Um, our last framework was 2011 to 2014, four years, so this is a bit longer and much more extensive. We've also shifted to energy-based targets this time around. So as you know, in the last framework, our targets were demand, peak demand-based, uh, due to the need for avoided capital costs. Well, we've shifted that to consumption, uh, kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours, and the big bad terawatt hours across the province. So um, that's what our targets look like this time around, and that's going to be part of what I talk about moving forward uh, with changes in the programs. We need to address that whole peak demand issue and where we're landing with it currently. We also have the biggest targets we've ever had, uh, and, and we've shifted a little bit from being able to count one-time projects to looking at persistence. That is also key in some of the program updates I'm going to give you. So again, these targets are province-wide. I'll go back one here. There we go. The targets are province-wide, and so every LDC was given individual targets and budgets. Um, how many of you are just strictly Toronto-based? Okay, and so I would then guess that the rest of you have portfolios that span multiple LDCs, if not the entire province, yes? Great, so everything I'm about to say is applicable to the entire province, except for the pilot programs, and I'll note those. Those are Toronto Hydro specific. Uh, so I'll highlight where programs are not available outside of the Toronto Hydro area. So part of our mandate uh, was to work collaboratively as LDCs to improve programs in the province via a mechanism called working groups, but also to collaborate with gas utilities. Uh, I'm guessing that since you have electricity in your building, you also have natural gas. Dealing with both of us at the same time, sometimes parallel, can be a bit of a pain point, and so we're working with the gas companies to be able to bring that conservation conversation to the table all at once, just to make things more efficient on that level. Right. Spoken about a lot of this. So that sort of sets the stage for where we are with, with framework and transitioning and what we've been mandated to do. So if we look at the, the programs that are available, uh, and it sounds like most of you are familiar with these, the ones that are continuing in the marketplace are, first and foremost, the retrofit program. That's 80 to 90 percent of the work that takes place uh, in buildings. Who has applied for retrofit incentives in the past? Awesome, and for those of you that haven't, let's have a conversation afterwards because there's lots of dollars on the table. Um, we also have audit funding, which is a mechanism through which customers can apply or property managers can apply to highlight opportunities in the building and have those audits incented up to 50%. 
Uh, existing building commissioning, I'm going to talk a lot about. We're seeing a lot of activity around existing building commissioning, and that can be re- or retro-commissioning, and there's an important distinction that I'll talk about. High-performance new construction is continuing, although we know that 2017 building code uh, is coming out soon, and so that program will go under take on a major overhaul moving forward. Process and systems upgrade, formerly known as PSUI, it's now just changed the initiative to program, PSUP. That was initially launched into the marketplace for industrial users, but we've seen uptake from uh, the institutional side, so healthcare and academic, and also some large commercial. So that is for more in-depth uh, projects, small capital projects where the incentive goes beyond what a retrofit will allow. That's also where we fit in our embedded energy managers. Does anyone have an embedded energy manager? Great, what company are you from, if you don't mind me asking? Excellent, yes, so Rob Dedicoli is your, your EEM. Anyone else? Who do, you, what, who do you represent, if you don't mind me asking? Brookfield. Brookfield, are you Brookfield as well? Excellent. So um, and embedded energy managers have been key for us, um, both throughout the last framework and moving into this one. Uh, customers can apply to have funding to bring in an internal resource who then identifies and progresses energy efficiency projects through all of our programs. And so a, pr a good percentage of, if not all of their salary, can be covered by this funding. If you have multiple facilities or one large facility, I'd encourage you to talk to me or your Toronto Hydro rep about that opportunity. Uh, it's about embedding conservation as a corporate culture. Uh, as well under PSUP is monitoring and targeting, a very misunderstood program. I'm going to talk more about that. And preliminary and detailed engineering studies, yet another tool that we can use to look at energy efficiency projects, even to the extent of things like CHP, combined heat and power, and understand if they would be applicable at your sites. One of the programs that has been replaced, in fact, the only one that was discontinued and a new version is hitting the marketplace soon is small business lighting. So it used to be uh, that we had pre-selected uh, lighting contractors that approach small businesses, any business with a peak demand under 50 kilowatts uh, to do $1,500 worth of free lighting upgrades. Great program did well in the province, pleased a lot of customers. We've gone to the next generation of that program now and it will be launched soon. Uh, it's more of a cost sharing model, so as we move into LEDs, we know they're priced a little bit higher than the last version of efficient lighting. Uh, it's more of cost sharing, but it still is above and beyond what we can offer via retrofit. Uh, so look for that coming soon. All right. I don't want to spend too much time on these program basics, but I will just walk through them and please interrupt me if there's anything I can highlight from a, a high level with respect to eligibility or program rules. Uh, I talked about small business lighting. That is coming soon. It's up to uh, $2,000 in funding based on cost sharing and it's very much measure dependent. Uh, one of the important things to note about small business lighting, uh, the new version, is that we're increasing that threshold up to 100 kilowatts. So more small businesses will be able to apply, and we are allowing businesses that participated in the past to re-participate because we know that lighting is changing so rapidly. Someone who participated in 2012 might have a lot more potential to move to LEDs now. So um, that's going to be huge in the province in terms of meeting our targets and also engaging that small commercial customer base. Uh, for those of you that are retail, I would pay attention to when this is launched. Okay, audit funding. We are going to see changes to audit funding, but for now it remains the same. Up to 50% of the cost of an audit is funded, and that can be the whole building, or that can be what we, what we call building systems audits. Does anyone have experience on building systems audits? What did you have audited, if you don't mind me asking? Um, okay. Was that a whole building, or was that focusing in on one particular system? Several buildings. Okay, so that sounds like it might have been a, a whole building endeavor. What we can do, um, that is applicable under audit funding, what we can also do is take one system and audit it. So if, if you're not interested in having your entire multi-unit residential building audited because you've done lighting, you, you've done chillers, you kind of know those opportunities, are, are the low-hanging fruit is gone. Um, if you are looking at something like your domestic cold water booster pumps, 
we can provide up to $5,000 in funding just to audit that particular system so that you don't have to look at it on a whole building scale. There's not as much money on the table. It's up to $5,000, but it does cover up to 50% of that audit. Okay. And with all of our programs, I should have said this in the beginning, it is very important that you engage your LDC early on. Uh, most of them, if not all, require pre-approval. In fact, let's just say all of them require pre-approval. So even audit funding, you need to apply, get permission to do that audit in terms of the building that's being uh, funded for the audit and who is doing the audit, and then go ahead. We don't like to see pro, uh, retroactive paperwork in our office. It goes directly against uh, program rules in a lot of cases. We will advocate for you if you get yourself into a situation, but incentives are not guaranteed if, if we're in a retroactive situation. So just keep that in mind. A, a good, healthy relationship with your LDC is to your advantage in energy efficiency. So back to retrofit. Uh, this is what we spend the most uh, time on from an LDC perspective. It covers everything from lighting controls to building automation systems, installation and upgrade, M&T, chillers, HVAC RTUs, uh, pretty much anything that you can replace Lego style, I like to call it, in a building there's a retrofit incentive. We are even now starting to cover things like building film and building envelope um, measures at Toronto Hydro. We're working to find a way to pull out those small savings and provide an incentive. Um, so if, even if you think that the efficiency or the energy efficiency component of an upgrade you're doing is nominal, um, have that conversation with your LDC because we have come a long way in terms of what we can and can't prove uh, via option C and the measures that we're allowing into retrofit. So the incentives are something that I want to talk about. Uh, right now they're structured based on either consumption or demand. Um, and that demand component's creating a little bit of uh, the conversation that's happening with regards to updating incentive levels. But as we, as we move forward or as it stands right now, the incentive structures that are in place will be in place till probably the third quarter. I'll talk more later about where we're going with incentive levels, but they, the way that they're broken out right now, lighting and non-lighting, demand or consumption, stands. Does anyone have questions about that? Has anyone heard rumblings about the new incentives that are coming? No, okay, good. So then there should be no confusion in this room. <laughs> All right, existing building commissioning. So this program didn't have a lot of uptake uh, under 2011 to 2014. It started to pick up steam a little bit in, in the end of 2014 and certainly in 2015, which was our extension year. Um, it primarily or actually only at this point looks at chilled water systems. Uh, and, and it's quite particular. It can't just be a cooling plant. It has to be a cooling plant that uses chilled water. Um, and that's part of the scope that we're increasing with some of the program upgrades. So right now, uh, if you have a chilled water system, whether it's MERB or commercial, institutional, even industrial, um, and it's not scheduled for replacement within the next three years and it hasn't been commissioned in the last two years, you are eligible for existing building commissioning. And really what, what we do with existing building commissioning is we go in and say, are these is this system, are these components operating within their most optimal thresholds? Uh, we know that commissioning often doesn't happen properly uh, when the systems are put in place uh, and, and, um, and buildings are constructed if that's when they're put into place. So retro commissioning is going back and doing that commissioning properly for the first time. Recommissioning is for a system that has already been commissioned, but we know that within even two years of operation, we can migrate out of that efficient field and there are potential savings. Um, so existing building commissioning is um, is a huge opportunity for anyone who has those chilled water plants. And the scope that we're increasing it to is um, really anything that's cooling related. So we have ice, things like ice rinks that can't participate right now because the, uh, the fluid is ammonia. So in, in the expanded eligibility, those systems will be eligible. So we'll be able to recruit things like recreational facilities to undertake existing building commissioning. We know a lot of re and retro commissioning is happening. We're just not seeing a lot of applications and that could be to the very limited eligibility criteria right now. So that'll be coming soon. High performance new construction. I'll, I'll be shocked, Was, has anyone participated in this program? So that kind of speaks for itself with respect to HPNC. Uh, 
new construction is uh, is hard to target. You have to get in on the building conversations very, very, very early in order to be eligible. We're seeing a point where we've engaged the City of Toronto Better Buildings Partnership to deliver this program for us, and they are the proactivity is now there after years of being in the marketplace, and so we're seeing an increase in applications. But it's quite a painful process to apply for HP and C at this point. So. We're tweaking where we can. I'll talk more about that in, in a minute. And we're also going to align with 2017 building code next year. So look for major changes there. I've talked about the industrial programs. Uh, process and system has its own application, um, sorry, own option for applications that look a lot like retrofit, but you receive up to 70% funding instead of up to 50% funding. Now, there's a lot more rigor with PSUP applications. Uh, so if you're interested, it's best to engage an LDC uh, business development team member right away because the M and things like the M&V are, are much more intense with PSUP incentives. Combined heat and power, uh, CHP is a word or phrase or acronym you're going to hear a lot more about if you haven't had those discussions already. Um, essentially, it, uh, it takes burden off of the electricity grid on our standpoint and creates cost savings on, from a customer standpoint. But what it also does is addresses reliability. Um, so you have that system in place where if we ever have a situation like the ice storm again, which you know, these century storms are happening now every five years, so probably going to happen again. Uh, reliability isn't as much of an issue. Has anyone had that CHP conversation internally yet in their buildings? Yeah, a lot of uh, multi-unit residential buildings are having that conversation, so we're seeing uh, a growth in the, in the offerings in the marketplace for CHP with MERB in particular. There's a lot of opportunity, and, and obviously residents look for that reliability. No one had fun during the ice storm with the outages. Um, so we're meeting not only an efficiency need, but also that, that resident homeowner need as well. Um, one of the key things with providing a CHP incentive via these programs is that you have to have a use for the waste heat. Um, I'm not going to get into, into technical detail, but this is the point that makes it not really reasonable from an incentive perspective for commercial buildings. And so we can't incent where we don't meet that minimum 65% efficiency with respect to using the waste heat. But what it does mean is that there's a large opportunity for some academic uh, institutions, healthcare in particular, uh, we've seen a lot of uptake industrial processes uh, can benefit from this as well as hospitality, so hotels, recreation facilities, anywhere with a pool, that kind of thing where you can use that heat, laundry, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in CHP. But this is a very, very, very long sales cycle. We're talking years, so the projects we're discussing now probably would be implemented in 2018 ish 2019 for some uh, so very long investment in terms of uh, education and and selling that internally which we can help with um, engineering audits these are the the studies that i talked about earlier that can facilitate those conversations for large projects so for instance pes and des we can leverage those available study funds for something like chp uh, they can also be applied for for integrated controls and hvac uh, measures where extensive uh, investigation and engineering needs to go into the development of the, of the project. And energy managers, we've already talked about that. Huge opportunity. LDCs love embedded energy managers and customers love them as well. It's been very, very successful. So this is the Toronto Hydro only portion. So these pilots, while they may eventually reach their way to other LDCs, these are Toronto Hydro pilots only for Toronto Hydro buildings. Uh, but we think they're Fantastic. Um, the first one is RTU controls. So this is taking that sweet spot between VFDs on an RTU and demand control ventilation and really capitalizing in the crossover in terms of savings. Um, it is, uh, right now the pilot is a direct install model, so customers don't have to pay for anything. We go and we put the technology in place on the RTUs and we're recruiting uh, data right now to to get final numbers in terms of what the savings are. It's very positive. The pilot focus uh, was retail, big box retail, and we have about 28 units uh, using this technology at the moment. And we've had really good feedback around it uh, so far. So we're looking for that, probably that peak information to start coming in the later spring if the snow ever melts and we actually need cooling in buildings. 
Um, and then certainly the summer, and we would look to hit the marketplace with this program in, in the third quarter. The next one is pump saver. So I talked about those domestic cold water booster pumps. Those are a huge opportunity uh, in any building higher than six floors, basically. This one addresses hydronic systems. So if you have any uh, heating or cooling loops that are hydronic based, um, this takes those systems and looks at them and says, where are we not efficient? So typically what we have is um, pumps that are driving pressure in the system and then we have pressure reducing valves. Well, they're working against each other and not creating efficient operation. That's just an example. So what we do is we go in and, and look at how the systems are operating, put VFDs on the pumps. Sometimes pumps can be replaced and even downsized, uh, and that's based on safety factors and, and measurements. And then we look at the savings when we pull out that PRV. It's a very successful program, ready to hit market sooner rather than later. Uh, this is going to be particularly relevant in the MERB sector. So, and when I say MERB, I mean both condos and apartment buildings. This is very relevant, um, as well as some commercial facilities. Any questions on this one? Yes. Right. So th that's a good question. This is direct install at the moment. Uh, because we want hydronic balancing professionals, or at least we, we did for the pilot. Ultimately, we want that for the program as well. Uh, I believe the model moving forward is direct install as well. But where we are in terms of pilots with the, the two I've mentioned and the third one I'm going to talk about is we are in the uh, negotiation period between uh, Toronto Hydro and the IASO. So the IASO owns the programs provincially and the LDCs administer them. And when I say LDCs, I realize that Maybe not everyone knows what that acronym means, lar um, local distribution company, so your power company locally. Um, we are negotiating the terms of the business cases for all three of these with the IASO right now. When, uh, when we reach a conclusion, that's when we're able to go to market. Uh, so I, the intent right now is direct install. Fabulous business model for the customer because uh, the return on investment is infinite, right? Zero cost up front. And the savings we're seeing from these uh, are so good that we are willing to incur those costs directly for installation. Okay. And the last is something called OpSaver. This is our, our big bad pilot that we hope will change the world. So what we know is that there's a lot of activity in all types of buildings right now uh, around a retrofit. We call those Lego replacements, as I call them. But what we, don't, what we know is happening operationally that we're not necessarily capturing through these incentive programs is operational changes. Um, I have a slide coming earlier that highlights all of the differences between various operational um, measures. But OpSaver in particular hones in on the ones that aren't as easily measured uh, and maybe don't have an actual installation of a piece of equipment. So for instance, uh, a great example is day cleaning in commercial towers. We're seeing a trend of day cleaning where they don't want to incur the cost of having the cleaners go through floor by floor with lights on and HVAC running of cleaning from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. So the cleaners will come in during the day while the office is already up and running and HVAC schedules are implemented. And so they're recruiting that five to 10 uh, five-hour window of savings for lighting and HVAC. That's a great example. You're not going to be able to measure that on a building automation system necessarily, You're not, you, but you would be able to see it probably on option C, which is utility bill analysis. That's a change that's a hybrid between scheduling and understanding of the building and also human behavior that we would be able to capture that as you can see, doesn't fit into the retrofit model or any of the programs that I've talked about. Uh, that's just a really basic example. We are looking to hit market with OpSaver in roughly the third quarter, fourth quarter. We'll be having a launch event. And this will be applicable for buildings of a specific size. We're working on those details right now. It's mostly applicable to large commercial, uh, institutional, and industrial. Um, the way that we're targeting the savings and the size of the building it doesn't ultimately really apply to multi-unit residential at the moment, but we're always willing to have people through the door that can prove those savings to us. The key for this program is persistence of savings. So we need to show that two years down the road, those savings will still be in place. Three years, four years, we need to show that through the duration of the framework, that it's not a one-hit wonder in 2016 or 2017. Um, so those details will be spelled out when we release the program to the marketplace. 
All right, so CDM program business CDM program development. Um, I've gone through a lot of these. So the priorities that were identified for 2015 are new small business lighting program. I've talked about that. New energy manager program. That is currently in the marketplace. So we went from uh, a model of 80% funding of a salary and a target to two options for the customers, which are that same model of, of a base level of funding and a, and a solid target to a performance-based model as another option uh, for those that want to overachieve in their savings. So you can either choose the safe 80% funding up to $80,000 for a salaried position or make up to $150,000 for that same position with further savings. Retrofit program enhancements. I'm going to go through those. Retrofit is, was not broken. It was not one of the programs that really needed huge changes uh, from a savings and delivery perspective, but we know from a customer experience perspective we needed to do uh, a bit of uh, cleaning out the closet, we'll say. So I'll go through all of those changes in a minute. Third-party uh, CHP participant agreement. When I talked about CHP, I left out uh, an important piece, which is that while there's an interest, uh, a huge interest in the marketplace for a CHP, not everyone has the, the expertise or even the interest in owning and operating that system themselves. So a perfect example might be a condo that wants the reliability, wants the energy efficiency. But to have someone on staff that's uh, versed in the maintenance of, of sophisticated equipment like CHP um, is not, not necessarily that attractive. And so we are developing the ability to have a third party own that equipment while it's in your building, essentially, and, main, and, and take on the burden of the maintenance as well. Um, so that contract will be coming soon. I, it's near ready for release. Um, that's been very attractive for a lot of, um, some hospitality and a lot of condos. The upstream business case. So has anyone heard of, I'm sure you have all heard of upstream incentives. No. These are incentives that would be applied at the manufacturer or distributor level. So when you go into Home Depot and you're buying something and it says um, it has a, a line below the price that takes off $10 on that LED light bulb, uh, the manufacturer's rebate they're often called, that's an upstream incentive model. So rather than us targeting everyone in the room and saying, oh, when you install a VFD, apply for our incentive, what we would do is target the manufacturer and say, you're selling 100,000 of these units in Toronto in a year. We want to incent at your level so that the customer doesn't have to apply for anything and we will handle the paperwork. So we're looking at which technologies that would be most applicable for. And I suspect everyone here would agree that if you can get that rebate or incentive and you don't have to do any paperwork for it, that's a bit more advantageous than uh, the current application process. You need to be nodding your heads right now because I know how painful that application process is. <laughs> So under review for 2016, uh, we've talked about the incentive rates. Uh, so I, I hope I've made it clear the incentive rates are not changing today. They probably won't be changing until roughly third quarter, fourth quarter, if not early next year. Um, we are looking at that, that sort of misalignment between energy-based targets and still the need to consider demand and how we move forward with that. Uh, you will receive lots of notice in terms of incentive rates if and when they change. And typically, uh, there's some grandfathering of old applications that are already in the system um, through to completion. So no need to, um, no need to panic around incentive rates. You will have lots of notice and be able to strategize accordingly for your applications. Process and systems programs are being reviewed right now as well. High performance new construction I've mentioned. Audit funding is also being reviewed, um, and actually we have a business case on the table uh, for slight modifications, so look for that to come out soon. The upstream program, fingers crossed, will come out soon as well, and then commissioning. Um, I've already talked about how we are expanding the scope of that. We're also hoping to expand some of the dollars associated with different phases of the existing building commissioning scope. Um, so there's investigation phases, reporting phases, uh, and then there is an obligation, depending on what comes out of those reports, to implement specific measures, both um, retrofit and existing, and the commissioning piece. Um, so we're looking to expand a bit of that funding on the studies so we can get more of the data out of them that we need. And future consideration. So we have that operational pilot op saver uh, that will be coming soon. And then we're looking at how we 
align our efforts in, term of, in terms of operational savings in general. Uh, there is a section of applications that fall under retrofit, the retrofit program called monitoring and targeting. It can seem a lot like operational savings, although the retrofit program by nature requires an upfront investment because the cap on the funding is 50% of project costs. So m and um, we're looking at why it's not been as successful in the past and how we can make it more successful. One of the ways that we're doing that is by saying, when you put an m and system in place, there's often a service agreement that comes with it that both helps with um, the maintenance of the, of the equipment but can also help guarantee that persistence of savings. Uh, so we're looking at incurring or taking that on as an eligible cost. Um, people tend to, like, I get a glazed look when I talk about m and often. I, just give you a very basic example of MNT. We had a multi-unit residential building in Toronto that had electric heating in a component of their building. Now they knew that it wasn't being run efficiently and electric heat is very expensive. So what they did was invested in the metering of the uh, trace heating to be able to see when it's currently being used and then they could optimize that schedule and, and recruit the savings. So the cost, the eligible cost for that was the investment of the metering in order to do the monitoring and targeting. So that's just a very simplified example of M&T, okay? And collaboration with gas utilities. We are bringing gas to the table whenever we can, particularly around CHP. Uh, we we wanna have those conversations together. Uh, but where there's an opportunity to collaborate and combine efforts, even in pilot programs, we are doing that. Retrofit program. So uh, is there anyone in the audience brave enough to tell me part of, of where they've experienced pain with the retrofit program? Because I know there's pain out there. Right, and so you're having trouble showing value in, in efficiency efforts internally. Yeah, I completely understand the frustration there. The retroactivity is a piece. Uh, that causes a lot of pain in the industry. So we have created a mechanism. One of the changes that uh, we've been working on with respect to the, the retrofit working group, which I am co-chair of provincially, um, is addressing business practice alignment. So what that really means is we're not aligning with how decisions are made, when decisions are made, et cetera. We can't do anything about the overarching requirement for retroactivity as a whole yet, those conversations are being had and LDCs feel pain there as well. But what we can do is try and create a quicker approval process so that if we do get applications in the door, uh, we're not lagging behind in creating retroactive situations by our approval uh, process and, and program requirements. So we've created what, what we're calling a fast track for a small group of applications, anything with an incentive under $3,000 via prescriptive. So there are three tracks in retrofit, prescriptive, engineered, and custom. So we're testing that fast track with the smaller incentives under prescriptive to say, you don't have to go through the full blown application process, you give us a minimized level of detail. We say, okay, it's a, va it's a valid project because you've submitted this min these minimum requirements to us. You incur the risk, we will give you the green light, and we're just going to trust that the paperwork works out on the post side. So we shift all of that administrative burden to the post. But what it means is that you as the applicants and, and channel partners incur the risk of whether or not your equipment's up to specs, you've, you've um, given us the right detail to be able to say, okay, go ahead. So it's lessening the burden in terms of administration. Right, and so th that, that's not something that's listed on this slide, but part of the shift in the framework is that LDCs are sort of taking more ownership of their customers. It used to be a centralized website, and some LDCs would have information on their website and some not. We are getting our own tailored LDC uh, Save on Energy websites, so microsites we'll call them, where we can present that kind of information. And, and how a lot of LDCs are marketing it is go to your point person. So for the commercial sector, it's me. Talk to me. I will lay that all out for you. That's part of the de business development efforts. But to hear that kind of feedback tells me that there's not an alignment between audit funding, which should be that, that landscape of what are your potentials to retrofit, to existing building commissioning, to op saver. And so 
part of the conversations that have been happening are around whole building energy management. Let's stop the Lego stuff. That, that's great, and we want retrofit projects to continue, and that's absolutely of value uh, in buildings and, and to LDCs. But let's look at, look at energy management holistically, and OpSaver as well uh, sort of overlays that conversation. Let's look at how our building's functioning as a whole and what, what our biggest uh, bangs for the buck are. So I'm just going to detail uh, a few more of the changes that are being made. I've talked about the website, the LDC microsites. We are flipping the online application on its head. We have a new provider. Uh, I sit on the subgroup that's developing that application platform. I'm going to that meeting right after this presentation. So hopefully you will see some alleviation of pain with respect to actual applications into the system, uh, which will make us quicker on the back end, make approvals faster, and align more with how quickly you need to make decisions. Because what we know about uh, sales cycles is that we talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about them, and we do our due diligence internally, and then we make the decision and it's time to go. There is no time to do the application lots of times, and thus your example about missing out on an incentive. So it's key for us to start to align better with business practices. Uh, another example of that you touched on appliances is where we're looking at something like bulk purchasing. A lot of multi-unit residential buildings right now can't get... Um, incentives for appliances because of the way they're purchased in bulk and you can't attach them to one site necessarily. So we're looking at changing the program rules such that you can apply for a portfolio of buildings under one application. Uh, so that's something to look to. That, that will happen later in the year. It's not part of the first rollout of changes. Um, assumed versus calculated savings. So we're going to get rid of that whole engineering track and merge it into custom. So you have two options. Simplified uh, model, prescriptive, quick and dirty. We're going to do the calculations in the back end. You just have to tell us what you're installing. And full-blown option to submit calculations of your own. So that's where you lean on your channel partners and your consultants and contractors. Uh, lighting in particular will really like this change. Uh, fast track I've already talked about in business practice alignment. So look for a new face to retrofit coming soon. The foundation of the program will not shift. Uh, what, what is working is remaining constant, and so, and, but we're tweaking uh, and refining to make it more palatable for all of you. Uh, I've talked about all this already. I think we've actually covered... Uh, a lot of this. Um, embedded energy managers, two models, audit funding. We want to reestablish that path, just like uh, the point you made with transitioning from audit funding into retrofit. We want to make that path more obvious, and that's more of an experiential uh, change. Existing building commissioning, expansion of eligibility, um, and we're looking at the program rules in terms of when customers can reapply. Because we know that that two-year window is, uh, represents opportunity, when, when systems migrate out of that efficient zone, we want to make sure they can keep reapplying, even if it's the same customer. Right now, that's not allowed. We want to make sure we're capturing opportunity that continually uh, happens within a building and kind of installing that, that culture of continuous energy improvement. That's what the OpSaver program will be founded on as well, continuous improvement, measurement, reviewing of data, and implementation of strategies. And HPNC, um, in particular, we're looking at the worksheets and whether they're working for us and for you at the moment, and then addressing free ridership. I don't know if everyone knows this, but um, we have a net to gross factor that's applied to all of our savings. So I get a retrofit application in for one gigawatt hour of savings. That's a great application. But I take a 28% hit on the savings, so I only get to count 720,000 of those kilowatt hours because and some of you may have experienced this, the, it's the ISO's job to flag free riders, and so they do what's called EMMV, Evaluation, Monitoring, and Verification, where they'll call you a year after you've implemented a measure and say, hey, we just want to have a conversation with you around that experience with the Save on Energy programs. And by the way, was the incentive critical in the decision-making to implement that measure? And if you say no then that means you were a free rider, you were going to do it anyway, and my net to gross goes down. So it's our job to get out there and start influencing your decisions and making that incentive intrinsic to your decision making. Okay, so I've talked a lot about OpSaver. I don't want to throw out too much technical detail, but, but this is the spectrum of what we call system, systems optimization. Automation and controls, obviously, the ability to control our building, putting uh, controls and automation in place so that we know what's happening with our systems and equipment. Existing building commissioning speaks to how efficiently those systems and units themselves are operating, and things like chilled water set points, are they too high, are they too low, where can we rein them in? 
uh, monitoring and targeting, I gave you that example of, of the trace heating where we want to monitor a specific piece of equipment. It might not fall under the BAS, but we need that data in order to make a better decision, a better operating decision. And then op saver, not the capital intense side, low cost, no cost measures like day cleaning, where we are absolutely uh, modifying how our building runs, but it might not show up on a building automation system per se. And so the most popular opportunities, I like to end with this, uh, because at the end of the day, we want to make your buildings run more efficiently and help you get there and help you make those decisions. Here are the greatest opportunities broken down into commercial and multi-unit residential. LED lighting, huge, huge opportunities. The pricing has changed dramatically over the last three-ish, five years. Uh, the offerings are more sophisticated, more reliable. If you're considering LED, do your homework. Uh, yes, there's absolutely still junk in the marketplace, but there are really really quite reliable options. Uh, VFDs, put VFDs on everything you can. Uh, VFDs are huge. We're not, we're not capturing all the potential of VFDs in the marketplace, but pumps, fans, uh, looking at industrial processes, put them in wherever you can. I got the five minute warning. I hear you loud and clear. Um, cooling plant measures, let's look at cooling plants. Lots of opportunities, too many to list. Uh, data centers, any data centers here? Great. Data centers are a cash cow in terms of both business and efficiency. We have, um, we're looking at 24-7 free cooling in some of our data centers. It's really, really huge opportunities. Com recommissioning, monitoring, and targeting, and then demand control ventilation for anyone in retail in particular, uh, and hospitality, banquet rooms, academic and, and healthcare, demand control ventilation, even offices, ab absolutely, and MERBs. DCV, if you haven't considered it, do. It is uh, basically controlling your ventilation based on the amount of CO2 uh, in the room. MERB is similar, uh, but we're targeting specific areas in terms of lighting, so corridors and stairwells. The domestic water booster pumps, if you haven't looked at that measure, it's a no-brainer. Please uh, come and talk to me. We'll have that conversation. I will put you in touch with the MERB lead. His name is Mike McQueen, uh, and you'll love working with him commissioning. Garage ventilation control, so instead of CO2, we're going to monitor the carbon monoxide, and then efficient rooftop units. Lots of opportunities for RTUs. Combined heat and power, we've had a lot of conversation around. Um, what I will say is that it takes significant investment of time uh, and, and engineering, but it is uh, well worth it. I don't know if everyone saw Campbell's soup announcement. I believe it was either early this week or last week, actually. Um, they put in a huge CHP plant. The minister was there, uh, our CEO, talking about uh, what the lengths Campbell's Soup has gone to to be efficient. Uh, it's a really interesting case study uh, available on our website if anyone's interested. So all in all, lots of changes. Uh, we're looking for lots of feedback. It can make people anxious, but we're telling the marketplace to keep calm, carry on, uh, and engage your LDCs.